Okay, welcome to week 11. We're going to talk about multitasking this weekend. This weekend? This week. Whatever this is. Um, can everybody hear me okay? And see my screen. Good. Thumbs up. Thank you very much. And an I. Thank you very much. So what I'd like to do is start off with an example of one of the reasons we might need uh, multitasking. So let's uh, create a little swing user interface here. And we're, we're going to take advantage of the fact that we're running on top of Java, so we can actually use Swing to do the user interface. And uh, I'm going to create a real simple little user interface in a main here. And we're going to do a JFrame. And inside of him, we're going to say layout equals flow layout. And then we can say label equals a J label, and that's just going to be some output that I'm going to put on the screen there. And then I'm going to have a button, which is going to be a J button, and he's going to be saying press me, and we'll do some stuff with him, just adding an action listener. And when this action listener, when this button's clicked, what I want to do is count from 1 to 100 and then print that in that label on the screen. So I'm just going to have a 1.100 for each, just to loop through those numbers. And I'll say label.text equals it to string. And then I'm going to do a thread.sleep for 50 milliseconds, uh, just so we can actually see the numbers increasing there. Uh, now, this is going to cause us to pause. It's actually going to block the the current execution here so in general you want to avoid this um, especially when this is running on the user interface thread and we'll see what ends up happening in a moment here with this now i'm going to add these guys to my user interface set my default close operation whoops to window constants exit on close so when they hit that little x in the corner it'll close it Give ourselves a little size here, maybe 300, 200, something like that, and then make it visible. So there's a simple little user interface that should let us press a button and have it uh, display the results. So let's run this guy. And I'm going to put the little UE here in the middle of the screen. And I'm going to hit the press me button. And let's see what's happening here. Hmm. It kind of hung for a while and then displayed 100. Anyone have any idea what's going on here? Why why that just kind of ran for a while and then displayed 100? Any thoughts? Now if I press it again, I'm going to see the same result. Notice how the button isn't even coming back up until it's all, all done? Hmm. Let's think about what happens here in our user interface. I'm going to close that. When we run this code, something has to paint things to the screen. So we have a dedicated thread in our application that you can kind of think of it as having a little guy with a paintbrush painting on the screen super, super fast. And what happens with this add action listener is this is actually executed by the painter. So the button, when it's clicked, is going to execute this code by that actual thing that's going to do the painting. And what that means is that as long as this is executing, he can't do anything else because a given thread can only do one thing at a time. So as soon as we come in here, he's an account to 100, change that label's text. He doesn't have the chance to repaint it because he's currently working on just changing the text. And then he sleeps for 50 milliseconds. And then he repeats that for 100 times, which is why we're seeing it take like five seconds in order for it to, uh, to, to uh, pop up on the screen. This really isn't the behavior we want here. We need to make sure that the user interface can be updated. So the way that we're going to have to do that is actually assign a separate thread to execute the count and update the thing on the screen. That frees up our painter to actually do the repainting anytime that text changes. And that'd be a really good idea there. So we're going to have two different things happening at the same time. And this happens because our computers have different uh, processors in them, each of which can handle concurrent threads. 
in most operating systems, we do something called preemptive multitasking. And what that means is that if two things are running at the same time, the, it's up to the CPU to figure out how to split up the time between them. So the CPU will give a little bit of time to one thread, give a little bit of time to the next thread, get a little bit of time to the next thread, and so on. Now, if you have multiple discrete CPUs, he doesn't even have to divide up his time. We could set it up so that the different threads are running on separate CPUs, so they're completely dedicated, and you don't have to have that kind of parceling up of uh, um, function, uh, parceling up of uh, runtime. So preemptive multitasking. CPU divvies up the processing power. Now we also have something that we call cooperative multitasking. And this is a little bit more primitive version of cooperative multitasking where the developer must be nice and code it. Uh, I'll say code yielding. And so what this means is that when your code is running, every once in a while you have to throw a piece of code in there saying, okay, I want to yield control in case anybody else needs to do something at the same time. And this causes all sorts of problems because developers have no clue how to do this, unfortunately. Developers, you know, they, a lot of times, you know, you'll read some examples, read some examples, read some documentation, and you don't realize you're supposed to do this. And then on top of that, you have some people who really aren't that great citizens. They'll sit and say, okay, well, all I care about is that my application runs perfectly for the user. And if there's another application on the system running at the same time, eh, too bad. I'll just take all the processing power for myself. And so some people would intentionally not yield. And that causes all sorts of problems. So a lot of times... How do we spell divvies? I, I never can remember. Isn't there a uh, thing there? Dives. I'm going to just change that to divides up the processing power, and that way I don't have to worry about it. I thought it was like two I's or something silly like that, but uh, two V's. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's two V's. Or maybe it's like a couple C's in there, a couple extra letters that don't matter. Um, but uh, yeah, usually I'm pretty good at spelling, but that's just a weird one. So uh, anyway, the, the CPU is going to divide up that processing power. And they went this approach so that they don't have to rely on the developers being, being good citizens. Um, and that can be problematic if, if the developers aren't. Um, so we're going to take advantage of this preemptive multitasking. And when we have multiple threads running at the same time, we're going to have the CPU divide up. And the CPU will just keep track of where each of those threads was when it pauses that thread and then goes and executes something else, comes back, and then keeps going from that location on the other thread. So let's see what happens if we take this code here. And put in something to force it to run on a different thread. To do that in Kotlin or in Java, we can create a thread instance and then run some stuff on it. And let me just show you a couple different examples of what this might look like. And what I'm going to do is put a little note here saying, don't do things this way. You want to use coroutines. This is just an example kind of building us up towards so you can see what coroutines are and how they're so much better. So one approach you can do is to go ahead and just directly use the Java objects to do the threading. So you're going to create an instance of a thread, override his run function, and then do the, the functionality inside there. So we could do something kind of like this. We could say val thread equals object thread. And then inside there, we're going to override the run function. And we'll put that in there actually meant for this to be inside of that action listener. And so we have our little run function here that's doing its job. Note that because we're inside thread now, we don't need to qualify that sleep with thread dot. 
that gives us a thread to do something. And then we can say thread, ooh, what happened there? Thread.start. And, oh, I need to do that outside of there. There we go. And what this will do is this will kick off a thread, execute this run function inside of it, and now you have concurrent processing. Now, one thing to be careful of if you ever use this, maybe you're programming in Java and you want to use it, don't call run. If you call run, you're just calling this function in line in the same thread that you're trying to launch this from. Make sure you call start there. That's like one of the most common problems people have is, hey, my, my program isn't multitasking. What's the problem? And it's usually because they called run instead of start. So this is now going to create a thread. And in that separate thread, it's going to run things. Now, with swing, we're lucky that... Swing allows UE property updates on other threads. There's a lot of user interface toolkits, Android in particular is, is one that I use all the time, where it won't let you change the properties of, of GUI objects that were created in the GUI thread. Uh, and so you'll actually have to kick back over. And when we start talking about coroutines, I'm going to show you how you can end up doing that. Um, you could also, in, in Swing, if you want to be really explicit about it, you could say, uh, whoops, swing utilities dot invoke and wait and put that up like that. And what this does is this says, let me send off a, let do something, uh, send off a task to do, which is this Lambda to the user interface thread to be executed. And we'll wait until the user interface thread tells us it's done executing that. So this would sit around waiting for the user interface thread to first of all take it and execute it and then we can continue and doing this sleep now if we just did a swing utilities dot invoke or invoke later i think is the function call yeah invoke later then it's going to queue that up for the user interface and immediately come down here and sleep now depending on the function the, the type of behavior that you want out of this that might be appropriate to go ahead and let this kick off something and immediately go to the rest of this function there may be times when you really do want to make sure that that's actually been executed before you execute the rest of this function. So invoke and wait, we'll wait for it. Invoke later, we'll just kick it off and immediately continue. Um, you don't need to do this, whoops, you don't need to do this because Swing actually allows the UE, op, UE property updates. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea of what you might do if you had something else that uh, required the user interface kit to get involved. Um, in Android, there's a function called run on UE thread, which does a similar type of thing to this. So let's see what this is going to do. I'm going to set up this thread, start the thread, and let's try running this and see what it does. So I'm going to drag this guy over here. I'm going to press him, and hey, look, we have numbers counting. Because this other thread is the one that's updating that property, and every time that property changes, it tells swing that it needs to refresh the user interface. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of that too much, but basically behind the scenes, if we take a look at the set text function here, we're going to see that he has this revalidate and repaint call down here. And what these do is these basically mark the user interface as dirty so that when swing says, do I need to refresh myself? He checks for that dirty flag and then updates the user interface. It will mark things dirty at the lowest level possible. So if it's just a button that needs to be refreshed, it can refresh just that part of the screen. So you can get a much more efficient uh, user interface out of that. Um, not really an issue for this class, but just kind of a by the way, that's what's going on. Okay, so that worked out okay, but that's kind of verbose. And you know, we're Kotlin people. We don't like to be verbose. So Kotlin actually has a way to do this that's a little bit cleaner. So instead of doing this create a thread object and then do a start there, what we're going to do is we're going to change this to say thread with a lowercase t. We don't need to override. We're just going to do it inside this lambda and boom. Now, because we're not actually inside of a thread object here, we have to qualify this again. And then we get rid of that thread.start. 
So behind the scenes, what he does is create a thread object using this as the runnable, that run function, and then executes it. So we take a look at him, we'll see there's creating our thread. Notice how this is basically a template method that we're doing here. We're passing in the what to do, creating this guy, and then executing it. Now they have a few other parameters in here to help you set it up as a daemon thread or not. Um, just a little note on daemon threads on the Java Virtual Machine. The Java Virtual Machine will keep running as long as the only threads that are available, uh, or as long as at least one thread that's available is not a daemon thread. If all that's left are daemon threads, which are generally helper threads, it'll go ahead and exit the virtual machine. Um, one thing that you have to be kind of careful of is sometimes people will kick off some daemon threads and uh, it then let their main end. And then, boom, the program's done. Because by the end of the main, you no longer have any non-daemon threads running. It just quits. So just to kind of be careful about that. But the advantage of a daemon thread is that it won't stop the program from exiting. So sometimes they're fairly useful if you want to have something running in the background just doing something. Okay, So this is a little bit cleaner way to do things. Let's go ahead and rerun that. We should see the same behavior. Press me, and there we go. Ta -da. Everything's just fine there. But what do you think is going to happen if I click that button twice? Any thoughts? We're going to end up having two threads running at the same time. And they're going to end up kind of overwriting each other. So if I press it and let's let it go for a little bit, and then I press it again, now you're going to see this jitter where you actually have two different overlapping threads updating at the same time. Um, that could be kind of gross. Now there's a bunch of things you can do for this. Um, the most common thing is a technique called debouncing. And the idea with debouncing is you do one of two things. You either say, if I've got something already running, cancel it and then just start clean, or you say, if something's already running, just don't do anything. Just completely skip any processing. Um, there's also uh, another debouncing technique where you can delay a certain amount of time before you actually even do anything. So if you wanted to have some automated processing, let's say the user's typing in a name and you wanted to automatically save that to the database, you probably don't want to do that save on every single change, like as they're typing letters. You probably want to, every time a letter changes, pause for a moment and say, as long as no other letters have come in in the next half second or a second, let me go ahead and do a save. Uh, that way it, it generally replicates the idea of the user is no longer entering information. Now, maybe they're pausing in the, in the middle of typing something, but that's fine, you'll get an extra save there. But at least you won't be saving every single character they type. And if they're a fast typer, you could be doing a lot of work on that. Um, it's especially bad if you ended up sending that information across a network because those network calls can be super expensive. So this is something that we can do, creating a separate thread to execute our loop, kicking off a little update on the user interface thread, and then whatever other work we want to do. So this is kind of a silly example, but we're basically trying to, to say we're simulating some kind of large amount of work here. And we want to be able to update the user interface in, the, in between there. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so what I want to do now is kind of kick over to the Kotlin way of doing things. And let's see how I want to start this off. We're going to go into this number three. Pardon me, I've got a little bit of a, a cough going on here. Um, what we want to do is we want to have uh, something that's easy to work with and reliable. And one of the things that uh, I want to be careful of here is if things look like this, it's really not too bad. The, the code reads fairly well. Um, but think about what would happen if we ended up doing a whole bunch of actions. Maybe we're making a bunch of calls uh, to some web services. So maybe we're going to go and uh, get a movie from a web service, 
then we're going to um, charge a credit card for it, and then we're going to add it to our available movies list. Maybe that's three separate calls to that service. Um, we would have to set it up so that we make the call, wait for the response, make the call, wait for the response, make the call, wait for the response on each one of those three. Um, and you have to be careful of uh, making sure that you're, you're um, either doing synchronous calls to the server, so you're getting the data back, or you're setting things up to allow asynchronous processing. So maybe it, when you make a call to that uh, function that's going to do the service for you, that call returns a little bucket to you, and then behind the scenes kicks off a thread to make that call to the server, get the results back, and then drop the value in the bucket. And there's a whole bunch of different techniques for doing this. Um, sometimes you'll use something called a future or a promise, where you get an object back that's basically a bucket, and it gets filled in when the result's ready. Then the user of that can say, okay, I'm ready to get that, I'm gonna say, future.get, and it waits until the result's coming back, which isn't necessarily a great way of doing things, but it works. I mean, at some point, you're probably gonna definitely need your data, so you're gonna need to do that somewhere. Uh, but uh, you know, those types of things, whenever you do asynchronous processing like that with several steps, a lot of times you're gonna need some callbacks. You're gonna need to have things attached to listen for results. And these suckers can get nested and it becomes really, really hard to read and really hard to reason about. So one of the things that they tried to do with coroutines is instead of trying to have everything being, make some calls, set up some callbacks, wait till I have results coming back and then do something, we want it to just tr look exactly like a normal function. We don't want it to have any extra type of decoration or very little extra decoration to, to say that I'm doing something inside of a thread. So what they did is they approached this using cooperative multitasking. So we're gonna be able to do it in a library because as soon as you go with preemptive multitasking, that's being handled by the CPU. They went with cooperative multitasking in a library and really came up with a clever way to handle the good citizen approach. They used some things called suspend functions. And the idea with a suspending function is it's a function that can be paused at various points and then later on continued. And anytime you mark a function as suspend, it will automatically give it the chance to let somebody else do some work. So if you have a suspend function and you call it, boom, there's a pause, other people get a chance to do their work, and then when the processing power is available again, it comes back to you. By having these suspend functions that you call for various reasons, uh, it, it takes out the uh, explicit having to yield. You just make it part of your normal processing. And we're gonna see how these things work in a little bit, but the, the kind of core of this is if you think about a suspend function as having an object passed to it, I'm gonna say an extra implicit parameter. So when the compiler compiles this, it adds a special parameter Pardon me, I've got an alarm going off here that I have to try to cancel. My phone is, um, for some reason, an update on the phone. It, it's not popping up uh, the, the clock, or the, the alarm interface on it. So I actually have to go digging through to find the alarm and turn it off. Um, I don't know what's going on with that, but it drives me nuts. Uh, anyway, so um, when these suspend functions are compiled, it's going to add an implicit parameter called a continuation. And the easiest way to think about this is a continuation keeps track of where you're going to restart and what data you're going to restart with. So if you think about a suspend function, I'm just going to write up kind of a slightly pseudo code -y type thing. Say, uh, you know, do x, do y, call suspend function z and then maybe uh, do a do b and call suspend function c whoops if you have something kind of like that think about how this function is broken up so if we're calling a suspend function here that's going to be a point when foo 
can get paused and then somebody else can get a chance to do things. And then once we once we're done, we can come back to this spot and continue execution. The easiest way to think about this is if we actually broke these functions up into chunks. So we have a chunk here, we have a chunk here, and then we have a chunk here. And then if you think about behind the scenes, a when statement telling you which chunk to execute at any given point. So something kind of like this. So if I have my continuation, and we say something kind of like, and it's not exactly like this behind the scenes, but it's pretty close. Whoops, so I can get this. This is what's hard about writing code inside comments. And then we can do something kind of like this. And then if we had two, and then we have three, something kind of like that. This is kind of a reasonable approximation of what's going on behind the scenes. So when we first come in, it's going to have label one. It's going to execute some code here. And actually, I should put another little thing here saying load data from continuation. And then save data from continuation. Something kind of like that. So if you think of the function kind of being broken up like this, when we first come in, it's going to have no data to load. It's going to execute some stuff, save some data, and then, boom, we return. So now the the uh, framework behind the scenes here says, okay, I'm going to hold on to that continuation. When I get a chance, I'm going to come back with the continuation set for label two. So the next time it comes back in here, it's going to call this guy. Next time it comes back, it's going to call this guy. And so this lets it break the function up into chunks, where up here, you didn't really see that. It's kind of hidden behind the scenes, all based on those suspend, break, those suspend uh, um, uh, calls to other functions. Each function that calls suspend functions itself has to be a suspend function. And so what this does is as soon as you call anything inside here that's a suspend function, you have to be a suspend function. And then people who call you have to be suspend functions. And the way that works for you is it is, is that uh, takes care of that good citizen thing for you. There's no way for you to not have these suspend functions in here. There's, there's no way for you not to yield in the right yield in once in a while. Now, if you know you're going to be doing a lot of work, like if you're going to do a loop through a million items and do something heavy on each, you're going to want to call yield explicitly or some other suspend function that doesn't do anything. Yield is basically just an empty suspend function. It's just there to mark a breakpoint so that the continuation can come back in and do its job. Um, but it's it's really, really brilliant the way that they have a little function that looks like a normal function and then has this ability to actually pause and then let somebody else do some work at the same time. These things are all run on something called dispatchers. And a dispatcher is a group of real threads behind the scenes that's going to do your processing for you. And there's a few dispatchers to start with. Main, which is your UE threads. Default, well actually let's say IO first. Good for blocking IO. So if you're going to make network calls or if you're going to deal with the file system where those calls end up blocking, the, this IO dispatcher is optimized to handle that. And then there's default, which is general worker threads.
And when you first launch a coroutine, it's going to pick one of these uh, dispatchers to run on, but you can switch anytime you'd like. To switch, you use something called with context. And so if you have a, a suspend function here, inside of here, whoops, you can say with context dispatchers dot main and then you do stuff on the UE thread. So if you want to update the user interface, boom, he goes right there. If you wanted to do stuff, some IO, you could do that. If you want to do some general working, you can do something like that. And you can nest these. So maybe what we want to do is start off by saying, it's in the default dispatcher. We'll do some background work a few times here. Maybe we will Oops. update the UE to say we're loading data or something like that. And then be done there or something and maybe even you know you have something in here update your progress if you want to have a progress bar on the screen or something like that then you might have some general background work maybe you throw some IO in there somewhere something kind of like that and so you can nest these however you want to and Anything that's not inside another with context is just run on that default dispatcher. And so this makes it so it's just a very straightforward flow for how you want your logic to proceed across multiple threads. And that's really pretty awesome. Uh, any questions so far? I know we haven't gotten anything concrete yet. We're still conceptual at this point, but we'll get a little deeper. Concepts making sense so far? And you're not going to see this too often. You know, most likely what you might see in some applications is a default, and then once in a while do something on the UE, and then the rest of the stuff just runs in default. Or maybe you start off saying it's on I.O., and you have a couple little UE update points inside of it. Okay. <clears throat> so in order to use these, there's a, what about handling errors? We will come back to that. That is coming. Um, it's uh, exception handling. And the thing that's really super cool about this is notice how this thing looks like a function. You put your suspension, your exception handling around it, just like you would anything else. And it works and it's just brilliant. I mean, I, I love these things to death. It's made my life so much easier. Um, so it's basic exception handling. We'll do some of that a little later. Okay, so let's see where we're going next on this. Um, with a coroutine, in order to kick one off, you need something called a coroutine scope, which is going to say what scope you're running the coroutine under. Now, this coroutine scope points to something called a coroutine context. And a context, all he is, is they call it an indexed set of elements. And it's kind of vague. Basically, it gives you some properties for how something is being run. The most common stuff you have inside of here, you have a coroutine name. So if you want to use for debugging, it's an explicit name on something. Usually it's for debugging. Um, you, you have a uh, um, dispatcher listed inside there. when you're launching. And um, there's a couple other things, but those are the two that really matter the most. Uh, if you want to put a name on something, that's great. Dispatcher, fantastic. Um, the coroutine scope holds a context. And the reason for that is that it's, it's basically a way 
to capture a context that you're going to use to run something. Uh, anytime you create a new co a new coroutine that's running, it creates a new context for you. You can use that as the scope for other coroutines being run, or you can modify it. You can tweak it by replacing some of the indexed items. When we're creating these guys, often there will be a common contexts scopes oops defined by the platform for example there's something called global scope which they originally were using this as kind of a generalized launching pat point do not use this it was just a little too general it's it's much better to explicitly create a scope yourself or let the platform create it. Main scope sets up a basic scope to run on the UE thread. So if you use the main scope to uh, to start a coroutine, it's going to initially be on the UE thread, but then you can switch which threads you want to run things on using with context. And what was the other one that I was thinking of here? Oh, um, Android has a bunch that it uses. Things like view model scope, life cycle scope. And there's one other that I'm blanking on right now that's kind of a main one, but uh, these are ones that actually have life cycles attached to them. And what's really cool, if you define your own scope, you can set up some ways to automatically cancel it. So for Android, for example, the view model scope will automatically cancel any coroutines that it started if the view model is no longer active. So when, as soon as the view model goes out of scope, all the things that it might be running behind the scenes automatically go. Lifecycle scope could be attached to an activity, which is a screen, and whenever the screen is paused or you know, there's some other conditions you can do it, it'll automatically stop anything that's running along with it, which is really nice because a lot of times in Android, you might kick off a thread and have to explicitly start and stop it in different places. And if you miss, that thread could be leaked. It could just keep running behind the scenes. And that's really bad news. Um, so often you'll use some of these scopes uh, to start with. Let's create our own. I'm gonna say val context equals, we're just going to start it with a coroutine name. Um, oh, I do not have the coroutine libraries imported. Ha. Let's take care of that. Let me see what we got here. So let's say coroutine dependencies. Let me change that window size so you can actually see it. So I just did a search for coroutine dependency that I'm going to include there. And depending on where you are, if you're on Android, you're going to use the Android uh, coroutine dependency. I'm actually going to use it for swing. So let's take a look at this. And we're going to find one. Um, I believe this is the one we're going to want. Let me actually grab it from the Maven repository. So up here is going to be the title of it. Do they have the, let's go to 161. There we go. And I can go to Gradle and I can just copy that. Let me copy the short version. And then I'll come back over to my project and we're going to tweak our build.gradle. Notice how we have this dependency section here, which is what external libraries we're pulling in. I'm going to add this in as an implementation dependency. Now you could use it as a runtime only dependency uh, because it's basically giving you providers for things like main scope. Uh, but uh, I, I like to just do it as implementation. It's just more consistent for me. I'm going to tweak those. Once we've updated this, I'm going to hit the load gradle changes. And that'll make sure that Android Studio is back in sync with everything that was inside of the Gradle file. And so now 
I have coroutine name available. Yay. I'm just going to call it worker. And you can call these whatever you want. If you only have one scope, worker might be plenty, plenty fine. But if you end up having multiple scopes that you want to keep track of when you're debugging, it might be a good idea to give them more specific names. So there's a simple context for it. Now, if we wanted to, we could say explicitly add in a dependency. And what this plus does for us is he is the plus method on the coroutine name. And it creates a brand new context that has both of these inside of it. So coroutine name creates a, a coroutine context with just a name. Once you have that context, it's adding in the dispatcher. So now we have multiple things. And if later on we wanted to change the dispatcher, we could say context plus dispatchers.io, for example. And it switches the, depend switches the dispatcher to IO instead of dis default. Now, the scope is what I'm going to use as a handle to be able to launch coroutines. And uh, also, I could do cancellation on them if I wanted to. Uh, I could do a cancellation of everything that this scope has actually created if I wanted. And what I'm going to do here is say coroutine scope passing in the context. And that's usually all you do when you're creating this, the actual scope. So let's take a look at a version of our GUI using coroutines now. So let me copy that from here. Over into here. And we're going to tweak things a little bit. I'm actually going to bring these into my main. And let's see. So we're not going to do this. We're going to use our coroutines. So what we need to do is in, when this action listener actually does something, we're going to kick off a coroutine to do some multitasking for us. So I'm going to say scope.launch. And by default, he's going to launch it in dispatchers.default. Now we're not doing any file I.O. here or network I.O. So that's a good choice for that. So inside of here, I can do this stuff just like that. And then instead of this swing utilities invoke and, lay, and wait, if I needed to for whatever user interface I'm running with, I could say with context dispatchers.main, just like that. And so now this code will actually be run on the user interface thread there. We're forcing it by using that. Okay, and I think that's all we're going to need inside this little example. Let's go ahead and try running it. I'm going to bring this guy over. I'm going to say press me, and there we go. He's doing the same kind of thing it was before. Now, if I hit press me again, I'm still going to have that same issue because there's two different ones running at the same time. Okay, questions so far? So let's think about that cancellation. If we were doing things with threads, we would have to keep track of every thread that was launched. So if we had a thread calling a function that launched other threads, we would have to somehow keep track of every single thread that's being uh, created so we can cancel them all. And that's really painful. Coroutines have this concept called structured concurrency. And what ends up happening is when you have a parent coroutine launch child coroutines, if you cancel that parent coroutine, it'll automatically cancel the child coroutines. It'll also, depending on how you configure things, if you have an exception in one of the nested coroutines, it can cancel the entire co the entire parent coroutine. There's a couple little variations on that where you can set up um, something called, oh, what was the name of it? Oh, I'm blanking on it. Um, supervisor job. Um, you can set up a, a supervisor job to track all of your child jobs. And then if you do a cancel on one of the child jobs, it won't cancel everything that the supervisor started. It'll only cancel that specific job itself. Um, so, uh, and you know, if you cancel sub, uh, sub coroutines, it'll cancel the entire parent chain as well 
unless you run it under a supervisor job. I'm not going to get into those details, but if you ever need to have just kind of this one top level thing that doesn't cancel everything in the world and you can cancel individual things, think about supervisor job. Okay, so uh, let's see, where was I going with this? So we have a pretty simple little example here. Let's think about the cancellation and how we can actually cancel things. First of all, we're going to need some kind of button to be able to do that. So I'm going to create a button that I'm going to call cancel button. And then inside of here, I'm just going to need to do my cancel action. Well, to cancel something, I need to hold on to what the thing is that I want to cancel. So I'm going to keep track of the job that's created by this launcher. Anytime you, you use the, the launch builder here, it's going to create a, sorry, barking dog outside. Anytime you use the uh, launch, it's going to create an object called a job. So let's keep track of a job here. I'm going to say job, job question mark equals null. So to start with, no job is running. That's what I'm representing here. And what I want to do here is say job equals scope.launch. So I'm going to keep track of the current job. And then at the end of that job, I'm going to say job equals null. So once I'm done, just go ahead and kill it. In my cancel button, I can say job question mark dot cancel. Boom. Nice and simple. And what this is going to do is this is actually going to throw an exception inside that coroutine which you can handle if you want to you know, clean, do some cleanup when something's being canceled, or just let it propagate and it completely kills your coroutine. There's one other little thing we want to do inside here. When we press this button, we currently have it launching a new coroutine every single time uh, the button's pressed. So we have a couple choices here. The easiest choice is to say that if I currently have a job, go ahead and cancel it and then we'll just start a new one. So that's one option you have. Sometimes that's a good option if the button has to act on the most recent data every single time it's pressed. You know, maybe you're doing something related to the current time. You don't want to ignore the new request. You want to basically cancel what you had and restart a brand new request. Okay, so this is a, a pretty simple setup here for cancellation. We need to add that cancel button to the UE, otherwise we're not gonna be able to hit it. And let's try running that. So there's our new user interface. Let's go ahead and hit press me. We'll just let it go all the way through to make sure that still works. There we go. And now let's try canceling it. Boom, I hit cancel and we stop. Nice and simple. Let's try pressing press me more than once. We'll just let it go for a little bit. I'll press it again and it restarts. And it works brilliantly. So it's a nice, simple way to keep track of things that are running and be able to cancel them. Any questions on that? Okay, so let's try putting a little something inside of here that's going to uh, throw an exception. So maybe inside here we have something that says if it equals 57. Throw new uh, throw runtime exception, something like that, and let's see what ends up happening here. Boom! Note how the exception has propagated all the way up here. We're just getting it printed out. Um, it's not actually stopping the program here because the, the coroutine handling is, is catching that and dealing with it. We can catch it and deal with it ourselves. Let's go, so it's basically just killing the coroutine. The, the overall uh, code is still running. Um, we can actually do something in there saying if there's an exception, let's handle it. So if I do this, oops, let's see if I can view this, come on, get out of there, there we go. And maybe at this point, I want to just exit the application. Let's try that and see if that works. 
I uh, did something is not matching up here. Well, this section I should replace with exit process. Um, oh, that's okay now. Let's try running it. Press this. And no, that actually didn't work there. I'll have to check to see where to put that one because that's, I thought. Oh, I didn't catch it inside the, I had it outside of the, let's try that. And there we go, it actually exits. Uh, so depending on where you put it, it actually makes a difference. Yeah, I should actually put things in the right spot. Uh, but you can actually have your exception handling at any level you want inside there. And you could catch cancellation exception if you wanted to, just to do some cleanup. I wouldn't recommend you ignore it. Um, I believe it might be possible to ignore it. I have to check a look at that. Uh, but um, you generally want to have, if things are being canceled, clean up when you can. Now with the cancellation, it's really important that if you have a lot of work going on, you do some yields in there so that it has a chance to actually send in that cancellation exception because that can only be triggered at suspend points. Okay, any questions so far? And the um, uh, exception handling is one of the big benefits you get out of this is that you can just put it at any level just like you were in a normal function and it just works. Okay, so let's take a look at, let's see, did I want to do that example? Yeah, let's actually do uh, this other example I'm thinking of here. One of the things that, that really bothers me with normal threading that you'll do in, in Java, for example, is um, that you might have a function defined. Maybe it's public void. Actually, let's say public movie, get movie. And maybe this is supposed to be running on, you know, this is a function that really is supposed to be running on a background thread. Get data from database. And what they do is they have some annotations you can use depending on your platform that might look something like worker thread or UE thread. And the lint tool can kind of help you uh, in some cases. It doesn't always work, but basically if you have functions called from other functions that have been annotated worker or UE, it'll flag saying, oh, hey, you're running in a worker thread, but you called a UE thread thing. Um, and that's, it only works if everybody along the call chain played the game. Otherwise, it just works in little spots here and there. One of the things that's really fantastic about coroutines is you can go ahead and use that with context at the top of a function. And you're guaranteed it's gonna run inside the right dispatcher. So in Kotlin, with context guarantees which dispatcher is running the function. And what's really nice is you can do this for the function that's being called. So if I had a fun get movie, maybe with some ID being passed in, I can say with context dispatchers.io, just like that. And it has to be a suspend function because with context itself is a suspend function. So I have to make my get movie be a suspend function. And boom, I'm guaranteed that no matter where get movie is called, it's going to be running in dispatchers.io. And because it's a suspend function, it can only be called from another suspend function or from a coroutine launcher. We have something here that has to be run in the background on the IO thread. There's no way for somebody to run it anywhere else. Whereas this up here, it'd be possible to run that from the UE thread, depending on you know how things were set up here. Uh, I've had things like this happen where I accidentally call them from the UE thread and it's just, it's awful. This is a guarantee and that and you know, not only that, but this being a suspend function, it forces you to kick off a coroutine. 
So you're guaranteed this is running in a, in a separate thread. And this is huge. It, it helps so much to actually enforce some of this multitasking. Um, when you have a user interface that the user is going to be interacting a lot with, well, let's say Android is a great example here. When the user is scrolling around on the screen, we want that to be responsive. And so we want to make sure that your data fetching, especially if it's going to a database or a, uh, uh, a web service, is kicking off on a different thread and not distracting that painter thread. Okay, so let's um, see what this might look like here. Um, yeah, I guess I can I can do this this quick example. It doesn't actually really run and do anything, but just to kind of show you how we might break up stuff if we were making different calls to a web server. So I might put a delay in here. Delay. Oh, did I? Um, now that I'm thinking of it, I still have a thread dot sleep in here. Ouch. Whenever you're in a coroutine, don't use thread dot sleep. You need to use delay. Um, delay is a suspend function. And what that lets happen is because it's a suspend function, during that time period, it can actually let somebody else use that thread. Whereas when I put a thread dot sleep there, whatever thread was currently running, which is going to be in the, uh, the, default, disp uh, the uh, default dispatcher, yeah, default dispatcher, it was actually blocking that thread. Delay is a non-blocking call. And so he will allow somebody else to use that processing for that 50 milliseconds. Uh, and this library is, is just blazingly fast. It, it, you can create tons and tons of coroutines if you wanted to, many, many more than you have available threads on the machine. And they run super, super fast. So yeah, glad I caught that. That's, that would be a bad thing. Um, so we're going to put that delay in there. And then let's, um, let's create a couple little classes here. Movie... Receipt and status, and we'd assume there's some data on this. I'm just creating the classes as as a, you know empty classes for now. So I'm going to say he returns a movie, and then this one's going to be uh, let's say pay for movie. And that's going to be on the I/O dispatcher because we're we're pretending that. Uh, Pretend we're calling a web service. And then we can do something else here. Actually, he needs, needs to be giving a receipt. And then this one is going to be add movie to collection. And then that's going to return a status just to say if it was added or not. And so we got those guys. Maybe we have a suspend fun purchase movie. Something kind of like that. And this one I could say maybe with context dispatchers dot default. So if there's a certain dispatcher that you want to handle the logic for a function on, go ahead and call it. And that gives you that guarantee that the body of this function is being run here. And if you call other functions, like val movie equals get movie ID, val receipt, I hate the way receipt is spelled, uh, pay for movie with the movie, and then val status equals add movie to collection movie. And so on. So we could do something kind of like that. And if we had exception handling inside of this around these, if it's an error at any given point, we can go ahead and undo any previous steps that we had, as well as cancel the rest of this, this function by throwing that cancellation exception. Uh, it really it's just like a normal function, so how it how it feels. Okay, questions on that? So that might be how you might represent uh, web service calls, something kind of like that. Okay, let's see what else did I want to talk about next. Let's create a little application. And let's say that we wanted to do something 
where you have a user interface and you can select a movie and have its details displayed on the screen. And let's think about how we might structure this. And uh, on Android, this is a lot more prescriptive, but using a very similar approach that we might on Android, we can break things down into different objects to kind of help us out here. So we can have a data access object to start with, which is going to let us go to our database and get some things. We can have a, let's create a movie class for this one. And we'll say we have a val ID, a val title, and then maybe a val year for its release released year. And in my DAO, I would have my normal CRUD methods to, to put stuff in the database, to get stuff from the database and so on. I'm just gonna implement one function here to uh, say that we're gonna go get a movie out of the database. So it's gonna be a fun get movie, passing in an ID for him. And I'm gonna use my with context here on dispatchers.io because I'm doing database IO here. I'm gonna fake the database IO, but you know, the idea here is that we're hitting the database, so we want to do it on the IO dispatcher. Now, because with context is a suspend function, I have to make get movie a suspend function as well. And then inside here, maybe I will put, you know, put a little delay in here to simulate database access. Let's say super slow database access. Um, most likely your database is going to be a lot faster than that at least i hope so um, but this will let you kind of see this thing happening behind the scenes and then i'm going to say when id and i'm just going to pretend that i'm getting stuff from a database here and let me just go ahead and grab from my prep there there we go so i'm going to say if it's terminator return a movie object representing the terminator transporter and into the spider verse so i just have a, a few movies in my collection that i can get information about so nice simple dao here if we were actually hitting a database this would actually just be your squeal calls grabbing data from the database okay let's create a view model And this is a nice separation that you can create in your application where instead of having the user interface do all the thinking about how to manage the data, we're just gonna move it down a layer. We can have the view model manage the data more directly or use helpers like a DAO or a repository object, something kind of like that. But this separation gets a lot of the thinking part out of the GUI and it actually can allow you to use multiple user interfaces with the same data model behind the scenes. Um, it's possible to also have other domain layers beneath this where you're just dealing with data by itself. View models tend to have a little bit of knowledge about what's going to be needed inside the user interface. So it's, it's not from a data agnostic point of view. It's more from a point of view of how am I going to manipulate my data for use in a certain user interface. But you want to try to keep it uh, agnostic for the type of interface that you have. You know, in this case, I'm going to try not to know that I have Swing being used here. If I was an Android, I'd be trying not to know that I'm using views or compose. So we take a look at this view model class. I'm going to first of all have an instance of that DAO to deal with. So you can work with that. Let's go ahead and create some coroutine stuff so we can kick off coroutines. So I'm going to say private uh, val context equals coroutine name, view model context, and then private val scope equals coroutine scope with the context. Boom, so now we got some basic coroutine scope and context set up for us. Um, if you have some life cycle that determines when this view model is, is created or destroyed, you might wanna tie into the destroyed thing so that uh, you can ask your scope to cancel all coroutines that it created. Um, and let's create a little function here called load movie. And we're gonna say, let's launch a coroutine. And let's do something kind of like, I'm trying to think of how I wanna, 
So, so for starters, let's do a uh, a little observable, a little observer pattern here. So I'm going to have a uh, let's say private bar, current movie, and he's going to be a movie, and then I can have a val. Actually, let's put an underscore there. Current movie. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me do this right here. Private set. There we go. That's better. So I'm defining this current movie property that's nullable, and the setter is private, so I can only modify it inside of here. So I'm going to have in this scope dot launch. I'm going to say val movie equals dow dot get movie passing in the ID, and then I'm going to say current movie equals movie, something like that. So this will set that. And the problem that I have here is that I've changed this data, but there's no way for the user interface to know that the data has changed. So I got to think about how I want to do that. I need to have some way of notifying the user interface that the data has changed. So I could set up an observer here. Um, so on movie changed. Something kind of like that. And this will allow somebody outside the view model to plug in and say, let me know when the movie changes. Um, and if we wanted to, we could directly pass that movie in there. And then say on movie changed, passing in the movie. And what's he not happy about there? Oh, because it's nullable, I'm going to have to use this invoke syntax instead of the normal way that we call uh, a, a, a lambda. Uh, this is actually saying that I have a function here, and if it's not null, call invoke on it. Um, we could also do something kind of like on movie changed question mark dot let it movie. And that would work as well. So this gives us our normal function call syntax for the Lambda. Um, but this is a little bit shorter to, to type in. Um, just so you'll know that what invoke is, invoke is basically you're calling a function. I will say same as or similar as something kind of like that. So this should allow our user interface to plug in and hear. Okay, so let's take a look at a little user interface for this guy now. I'm just going to go ahead and do this in a main function. You could create a class to do your user interface, and you probably should. I'm just going to go ahead and throw it in the main function as I did. Oops. So we'll just create an instance of our view model. I'm going to create a little helper function here. I'm going to call movie button. And we're going to have an ID and a title, just so that I don't have to create a whole button every single time here. So I'm going to create a button here that has a title. Fill in some details here with the add action listener. And we'll go to view model dot load movie ID. So that should give us a nice little button that when you press it, we're going to go to the view model and do that load. Note that the view model is managing the coroutine for us here. We don't have to have this action listener start the coroutine. And this is a good idea. If you have something that you know is going to take some time, put it in the function if you can. Now there's trade-offs here. The big trade-off being who controls that scope for the coroutine. In this particular case, I'm explicitly creating coroutine for the view model scope. If what I really wanted is to make sure that this function goes away when the user interface goes away, I'd want the user interface controlling that scope so that I can tie into the hooks in the user interface and say, if the user interface is being closed, make sure I cancel all my coroutines. Uh, and it's usually common that the user interface is going to go away before the view model. 
And in particular, some, some systems like Android will hold on to the view model while the user, user interface is being changed. So in Android, for example, when you rotate the screen, it throws away the old activity, keeps the view model so the data is in memory, and then creates a new activity and just links them back up together for you. Uh, so the view model will have a longer life cycle. If, that, uh, if, if the coroutine that you kicked off is trying to write to the old user interface, you're in trouble. So you want to be careful about things like that. Now, if that's the case, you may want to pass a coroutine into the view model so that the main has control of which coroutine is actually being a uh, coroutine context. Uh, the, the main would have the choice of what's being passed in there. So just a couple things to consider there and where you're creating things. Um, for this one, I'm just going to assume that it's okay for this to live as long as the view model is living. Okay, so we're doing all that with the load movie. Let's actually create the user interface now. Create my JFrame. And I'm going to use a border layout this time. And I'm going to add a little column on the left edge, which is going to be some buttons that we can press. And we're going to put use a Japanel there. And he's going to have a vertical box layout. Oops, box layout dot y axis. There we go. And I need to actually pass in the panel. There we go. And so now we're going to add in some movie buttons here. And actually, I'm just going to copy that from there to make sure I get those right. There we go. So we have three little buttons on that edge. And then we're going to add a section in the center here. And once again, I'm just going to use a Japanel with a border layout. Or sorry, box layout, just to have things be vertical. And let's put some stuff inside there. Um, let's see, I'm going to need access to... I'm going to need access to the, the labels outside of this. We'll see why in a little bit. Uh, but I'll say val title label. And we'll have year there as well. Something kind of like that. And then inside here, I can just say add title label. And add year label. And what did I... Oh, I didn't make those labels. That would definitely help. There we go. Boom. So that should set up our little user interface. Now, the thing that we need to do is set up that listener so we can actually update things on the fly. So if we come over in here, oh, let me actually do my other stuff before I forget. So default close operation is window constants dot exit on close and set size. Let's say 300, 200 again and is visible equals true. There we go. And so now we're going to set up that listener here. And this is one approach you can take. You can use direct observers like this. Uh, if you wanted multiple observers, you'd have a list of them instead of just the one. Um, so I can say view model dot on movie changed equals this little lambda that's going to take a movie in there. And what I'm going to do inside here is say when I have that new movie, I'm going to update the title label and the, and the year label. So I'm going to say title label dot text equals um, title colon dollar movie dot title. And then we can do the same type of thing for year. And this is showing us one of the spots where having 
uh, null uh, null pointer checking inside the language itself just shines because we'll see right here this is telling us um uh, yeah what if, if the movie's null you can't just say movie.title so if I put in the question marks in there now I'm gonna get the title or the word null now I really don't want the word null there so I'm just gonna put Mr. Elvis with a blank string after him. And that should allow us to put the uh, information on the screen. So this is one approach to it, to doing this. And let's see if this actually worked. And so here's our little user interface. I'm just gonna expand it a little bit more there. And when I click on the Terminator, pauses for a second while it's loading, and then boom, the data's on the screen. Transporter, boom. Into the Spider-Verse, boom. Everything's cool. And that's one approach to setting this up here. Let's do another approach. And what I'd like to do this time is instead of using that explicit observer like I was, I wanna use something called a flow. And a flow is a special construct inside coroutines that will allow you to emit things on the fly. So you emit to the flow and something else collects. So you can have two different threads doing things at the same time. One thread that feeds in, another thread that pulls out. And that's super, super useful. Um, if you only have a single item, it doesn't matter quite as much. But when you have multiple items, it really starts to shine more. Flows are what's called cold. A flow will only uh, send the, the data out if somebody's listening. So it, the, the, when you're trying to emit to it, it'll block on the emit until somebody starts consuming things. And that can actually be great. You're going to be using this inside your, your homework, by the way. So let's take a look at a different way to do this current movie. So I'm going to start off with a private val. I'm going to call it movie flow. And I'm going to create something called a mutable state flow of nullable movie. And I'm going to default it to null. And what a mutable state flow does is it's basically a bucket that's going to hold on to a value and people can collect from it. Anytime they get a new value received, they can do something with that new value. Note that I made this private and I gave it a special name. I put an underscore in front of it. Normally I don't really like putting underscores in, but what we're gonna do is create a, another property here that's gonna be the public facing of this flow. And that other property is going to be a val movie flow with no underscore. And he's just gonna be a flow of movie, movie nullable. And what this does for us is it exposes the movie flow that we're actually adding things in as a immutable flow on the outside. So the caller won't be able to add things to it, which is really important here. Now I can't use that private set trick that I did before because both of these are vowels. All the set does is say, by saying private set, is it just treats it as though it's a val outside. Since these are both vowels, that doesn't help us. Um, there is actually a request in uh, the Kotlin language to help simplify this kind of logic because you'll see this in a lot of places where you're going to have a private version that's mutable and a public version that's immutable. And this is a really nice way to help protect that because you really don't want the user interface adding things to this flow. Um, but this is going to expose that for us. Now, in order to write things to it, instead of saying current movie equals movie, we can just say underscore movie flow emit the movie. And emit is the general form for any type of mutable flow. And mutable state flow is a specific type of flow. Um, but mutable state flow actually has another property called value that you can explicitly set and you can explicitly get just to see what the current value is inside of it. So I could also have said movie flow dot value equals movie. 
and that would work just as fine. Something kind of like that. So now that we're emitting this, somebody needs to collect it. So we basically have some thread on one side pushing things in, another thread on the other side pulling things out. So let's take a look inside of our code down here. Um, Oh, I still had my own movie changed. Okay, let's get him out of there. Oh yeah, I didn't need the I don't need that separate current guy. Uh because now that's all kind of baked in as one. The flow keeps track of the value as well as letting people know the new values. So down here. Let's see, this is happening inside here. The you know, view model dot movie foe dot collect. And this is the function that will listen for new values. And anytime there's a new value, the body of this code gets executed. So I'm going to put him up there. I'm going to say movie over here. And guess what? If we float over this, collect is a suspend function. Therefore, this has to be called from a suspend function or from a coroutine. So what we're going to do is define our little coroutine to use here. Do we have one inside here? We do not. Let me do a little coroutine down here. I'm going to say scope is main scope. Main scope is the one that represents the user interface thread, and it's provided by the library for us. So we can use that if we want to run this on the user interface thread. Now, if we take a look at this, the code that's running here is updating the user interface, so we should be running it on the user interface thread. So I'm going to say scope dot launch boom and there's our collector so we have this little coroutine that's doing our collection on the user interface side to update stuff on the screen so let's see how that looks when we run it assuming it actually runs correctly so there's our little user interface boy that's a gross looking user interface i'm going to say click terminator Boom, click transporter, boom, click into the Spider-Verse, boom. Now, if I got rid of that delay up in here, this will run super, super fast. So come over here, click terminator, transporter, and into the Spider-Verse, it's instantaneous. And if you're using a real database, you probably won't notice it either. It'll be pretty quick, assuming that you have you know, a reasonably normalized database and you're not getting huge amounts of data out of it. Uh, boom, we now have a, a simple little reactive user interface here that's listening to the, uh, the view model. The view model can stick stuff in anytime it wants and to meet the data out. Any questions on that? Now there's another construct called a channel. I'm not gonna get into it today, uh, but the idea behind a channel is that it's cold, meaning it's always gonna be doing its job, uh, even if nobody's listening to it. Uh, there are times you might wanna do that where you know, you've got a bunch of values coming through and maybe your listeners are gonna come and go on it. And when they come in, maybe they're gonna grab some old data that's been sitting around inside there. Uh, so, you know, there could be multiple things inside the channel. Um, you can also have multiple values in a flow if you used a mutable shared flow instead of a mutable state flow. Okay, so let's see. I think there was just one more thing I wanted to talk about. Yeah. And this session went by a lot faster than I thought it would. Um, Maybe I'm just explaining it better than I usually do. <laughs> Hopefully, I hope that's the case, um, as opposed to everybody you know staring at their screen like in panic, like "Oh my God, I have no idea what's going on." Um, so let's take a look at um, what if we want to have some other function contribute to our flow, uh, and maybe it's a, a a lot of values coming in there. Um, there's a couple different ways we can do things like this. Let's create a nice little sample class here. And one thing that we can do 
is use a flow builder to create some values for us. So if I said val flow one equals flow of int with a lowercase f, whoops, kind of like that. This creates something called a flow collector, which is what we're going to emit to. And inside of here, I can just say emit one, oops, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. Or if I wanted to, I could actually pass that flow collector to a function. So I could have a fun emit stuff. And then inside here, I could say flow collector dot emit. And I could even have, you know, um, some other uh, constructs in here. Maybe I said 30 dot dot 50 for each flow collector dot emit it. And you could even call recursive functions like this. Hint, hint, he says knowingly what's in the assignment. Uh, you can have a recursive function that takes a flow collector and then as it's visiting things or as it's actually creating data or whatever, it can add them and emit them. And because the flow is cold, these emits will wait until they're actually being accessed. So if somebody doesn't consume it or if somebody is you know, taking some time to consume it, it's okay. We're gonna we'll wait over here to actually emit them. Now again, because emit is a suspend function, that means emit stuff has to be a suspend function. This function here is a suspend function, so I can just call emit stuff passing in the flow collector. Now in a case like this where I'm passing this in, I could just make the flow collector be the receiver of this function. And now that becomes just a little bit cleaner there. And we can just call emit stuff directly. So for the assignment, think about these pieces here. That's going to be a big clue for you for part of the assignment. Okay, so that's one way. You can emit stuff and this this allows you to dynamically emit things to that that flow there um, another thing we can do is if we have a list of things we can convert that list into a flow so if i said i'm gonna make a fun foo here just for some sample stuff inside here if i said val list equals list of something like that if I want to turn that into a flow, I can just say as flow, boom. And now that flow will, uh, uh, I can use that directly as any other flow. I can just collect it. So I could do, you know, flow two dot collect. Once again, that has to be in a suspend function. So we're talking about putting it inside of a coroutine launcher. Kind of like that, and then do stuff with the flow. And I would assume that this is going to be somewhere else, like your user interface. Um, generally, you're not going to create a flow and immediately collect it in the same function. Uh, you know, generally, we don't create a flow and collect it in the same function like this. I'm just kind of showing the syntax of what you might end up doing with it. Um, we can also create a flow directly out of a list of things. So I could say val flow three equals flow of, and then pass in some values kind of like that. And now you have a flow with some fixed values coming in there. Um, another one you can do is directly create a mutable shared flow. So if I said flow four equals mutable shared flow, note that this is a shared flow instead of a state flow. State flow holds one value, 
and it's just going to change that. A shared flow is going to have potentially multiple values cached up in it, um, and it's expected to be used by multiple users. Um, whereas these other guys, this, this, uh, these ones that we've done here are expected to have a single consumer. So if I did something like this, where I have a mutable shared flow event, I can emit things to that and then use it. Now, again, with this, you're going to want to expose it as just a flow. So that they can't add to it, and we can only add, we're only adding to it inside. Um, and you can pass him the same way that we did to this flow collector. Instead of doing a flow collector, your emit stuff might look something kind of like. Oh, we could say mutable shared flow on him. Um, actually, I, is that going to be okay? Yeah, actually, that should be fine because these are uh, uh, extension functions. So then down here, I could say flow four dot emit stuff, and boom, it'll write things out. Uh, is he not? Oh, again, only called from a coroutine. Boom, just like that. And we can move him up there. Okay, was there anything else I wanted to talk about in there? Now, so these are just some different ways you can create flows there. Um, probably the most common ones you'd use is this guy and the mutable state flow that we talked about before. Okay, any questions on those? Any questions on anything that I've talked about today? I mean, this, this is just all the basic stuff from coroutines. There's, there's, there's uh, some more slightly complicated stuff going on that you can do. What I've talked about today will get you through probably 90% of the use that you need for um, coroutines. Um, and hopefully, you know, showing you that little user interface example kind of gives you a taste for how this would actually be used in a more realistic application. Um, and you'll be doing something kind of similar to that in the homework as well. Okay, any questions on anything? Cool. Well, that is actually all I have for today. And, uh, you know, it's, it's probably good because this is a lot to absorb to start with. But hopefully it's, it's got some sense behind it. And once you actually try coding it, it's not too hard. Um, but uh, if you have any questions, feel free to post them on the forum or send me an email. And other than that, have yourself a great week. Yeah, just, just my voice is just a little bit rough. So I'm actually kind of glad I've, I've run out of material for tonight. <laughs> Have yourselves a great night.